And just as we're seeing gold starting to break out relative to commodities, once we do have that final printing round, we will have gold and silver climbing relative to other commodities, not because of any lockdowns, but because of monetary panic. In recent months, the financial world has been abuzz with discussions surrounding a phenomenon known as the basis trade, particularly concerning hedge funds and their positions in treasury bonds. This trade, characterized by attempts to profit from seemingly small gains while risking significant losses, has drawn attention to the precarious state of the market, especially in two-year treasury bonds. In a recent video by financial analyst Rafi Faber, key insights were shared, shedding light on the current state of the market and what it means for investors. Let's delve into the expert analysis provided by Faber and understand the implications for investors and the broader financial landscape. Faber begins by highlighting the unprecedented levels of short positions taken by hedge funds in treasury bonds, particularly in two-year treasuries. These record short positions indicate an unstable market condition fraught with volatility. Faber warns that such extreme positions cannot be sustained indefinitely and may lead to disruptive events such as short squeezes or other market disturbances. Citing this instability, Faber advises caution, steering clear of treasury investments amidst uncertain market conditions. Transitioning to the precious metals market, Faber discusses the gold to commodities ratio, emphasizing its significance as a proxy for the profitability of gold and silver miners. He points out that after years of trading within a range, the ratio is now poised to break above its 200-week moving average, signaling the onset of a major bull run for gold relative to other commodities. This shift, Faber suggests, could lead to increased profitability for miners and potentially pave the way for a similar uptrend in silver, mirroring historical patterns observed in the late 1970s. So the first thing I wanted to share here is that it was a few months ago when this basis trade thing became big news. Uh, there were worries that hedge funds were shorting too many bonds, trying to pick pennies from a steamroller, is that the expression? Uh, and the amount of shorts in two-year treasuries is an estimation for how much, how many shorts there are in the market generally. So we have here a new record high in hedge fund shorts on treasury bonds, two-year treasury bonds specifically. We're at 1.831 million contracts short and a record long for, I think these are I can't tell if that's red or green, but whatever it is, it's the other side of the trade. So a record short position in treasury bonds is a very unstable phenomenon and it can't last. Uh, we'll see how long this one lasts, but it's going to create a lot of uh, volatile trading conditions in treasuries. What we can definitely see here is that this is not a stable market and treasuries are going to be dangerous. Something is going to happen in the financial system to mess with their prices, short squeeze, something like that. Who knows? I'm staying out of it, and uh, I wouldn't touch treasuries with a uh, $35 trillion pole. Okay, now I've show I showed this chart two weeks ago. Something is happening here. This is gold relative to other commodities. It's important not to confuse a commodity bull market with a gold bull market. There's a reason that we are gold and silver stackers as opposed to, let's say, oil or natural gas stackers. Though there could be natural gas stackers. I don't think that's particularly healthy. What we see here is the gold to commodities ratio. And basically, it's been in a trading range since 2011, since the 2011 top here. And we see here that the bull market really began in 2008. This was the beginning of the destabilization of the financial system. It was stable over here, the gold to commodities ratio, pretty much until 2006. And then it started to move up. And then in 2008, it really moved up. Um, but since 2011, it's been in a trading range. And also, since uh, 2021, we've been below the 200 week moving average, but that is now finally changing, which is suggesting that we are on a major bull run of gold relative to other commodities. And this ratio is really, uh, it's a proxy for the profit margins of gold and silver miners. So the higher this ratio goes, the more profitable miners are. If we zoom in here, we can see that we are right on the cusp of breaking the 200 week moving average for the first time since 2021. This is a very rare event in gold markets. The 200 week moving average is at 8.11 here, the red line we see, and we are at 8.10. We're just about to break it. Let's see how rare this is. Well, this has happened um, about three times since 2000. 
and eight when the gold to commodities bull, bull market really started. So it happened once in 2014, at the end of 2014, and that looked like a gold bear market, but it was really a bull market relative to other commodities. It was a commodity bear market, but gold was falling much less. And here it happened again in 2019, that we had barely gone below the 200 moving average here. So if you want to count this, fine. If you don't want to count it, you don't have to. Uh, you know, technicals like this is more of an art than a science. And here we have for the third time since 2008, we're breaking through the 200 week moving average. And once we break through that, I do believe we will be on a sustained bull market. You could call this a bull market, but what it really was was the shutting down of the global economy um, for the best reasons ever in the world that nobody may ever dispute. But if we iron that out as just a little blip of insanity, we're about to embark on a gold bull market relative to commodities and silver will of course follow. If we zoom in on silver, it was happening here, silver relative to other commodities. We uh, are at resistance here in the silver to commodities ratio of about 0 0.09, 0 0.1. We're just below the 200 moving average, so we're gonna break through it. It's just gonna take a little bit more time, and once we do, we should be in a silver bull market also relative to gold. And in that final year of the gold bull market, as we saw in the 1970s, late 1970s to 1980, silver should break out. It should be quick. It should be brutal, and it should be glorious. Now I wanted to go into the banking situation here. Um, this is banking reserves. Bank reserves are reserves that banks hold at the Fed. So this is really the liquidity line, how much extra liquidity banks need. Now, the higher the, the pyramid goes, the more liquidity that there is in the system, the more liquidity that is needed because banks obviously make loans and therefore they need reserves uh, to cushion against those loans and they themselves go into debt. So the more reserves there are, the more reserves are needed, which is why I drew these two lines in. You see here, this is right before QE3 in 2012, and then QE3 brought us up to a new level of reserves just below 3 trillion. And then once we fell back to the pre-QE level of reserves, we hit a repo crisis, and that was in September 2019. So we see the same thing here. We hit a new level of reserves um, because of the crisis over here, which we don't want to talk about. Uh, and then we hit high over here, adjust as 2022 uh, came into being. New Year's 2022, we hit a high. And then uh, QT starts again. The Fed starts drinking its balance sheet. We head down to about $3 trillion. The previous line of where the uh, new QE line stopped initially. Uh, and then we hit another banking crisis. This is around March 2023 over here. And so we're heading down Again, we're going to zoom in a second. I'll show you how far we are to, from this new banking crisis line, which I assume is about $3 trillion. It's not going to be exactly then, and it's not going to hit exactly when we hit the line. We see here in the banking crisis of 2023, it took a few months for this line to be uh, uh, approached for the banking crisis to be triggered. But it is around $3 trillion, and it will happen somewhere around there. Uh, if we zoom in, we can see here we are at 3.25 trillion dollars this number over here is about 3.585 if i remember correctly so we're down about 330 billion dollars in the last three weeks we could hit the crisis line anytime and uh there's no reason that we shouldn't because we're still in qe and even though the fed announced that it is slowing down qe it is continuing sorry qt they are slowing down qt but they are continuing it uh and the slowdown will only happen in june so we have another four weeks to fall on a 252 billion dollars to reach the three trillion dollar crisis line and then it should take a few weeks maybe a few months for the next crisis to be triggered somewhere in the repo market somewhere in the banking system i don't know exactly where it's going to hit but it is definitely going to faba then shifts focus to banking reserves illustrating their crucial role in maintaining liquidity within the financial system by analyzing historical data on reserve levels and their correlation with banking crises faba predicts a looming crisis triggered by declining reserves he highlights the Federal Reserve's ongoing quantitative easing measures and warns that despite announced tapering, the continuation of key poses a risk of exacerbating the crisis. Faber's analysis underscores the importance of monitoring reserve levels as a leading indicator of financial stability. Turning to government debt dynamics, Faber examines the shifting composition of debt issuance, noting a trend towards longer-term maturities. He explains how this strategic move by the government locks in high interest rates for extended periods, regardless of potential future rate cuts by the Federal Reserve. 
Faber emphasizes the implications of this debt restructuring on interest rate risk and cautions investors against overlooking its long-term consequences. And now this is the SIFMA table. SIFMA is that organization that crunches all the treasury numbers. Um, so we can see what's happening here. Uh, these numbers were just released today. So uh, we have here the gross issues of bills and notes. Bonds also, but bonds are pretty minor compared to these numbers. So we see here the net issuance of bills, that's short-term treasury bills up to one-year maturities, is down about $200 billion. And the net issuance of notes is up about $102 billion. So we see here that short-term debt is being moved into longer-term debt notes or two-year to 10-year maturities. And so what I'm saying is that long that interest rates, high interest rates that we see now are being locked in for between two to 10 years. And so even if the Fed cuts interest rates in an emergency, the federal government is still going to be paying these high interest rates because they've already locked them in. They're moving them to notes because there's no more room on the bill side. That's already stuffed to about $6 trillion of debt that's circling, cycling through every two to three months. And now reflecting what is going on in bank reserves, meaning they're falling, we can see the same thing is going on in bank deposits. Bank reserves are bank reserves and bank deposits are different. Reserves are bank money that belongs to the banks that they stuff at the Fed. De uh, deposits are obviously depositors money that does not belong to banks. But we can see here that the same deflation that's going on in bank reserves is going on in bank deposits. And bank deposits account for about 82% of the money supply. So I made two little rectangles here. Uh, one is this week's deflation. This is the week to week growth or shrinkage in bank deposits. We see here that the latest number as of April 26th, there should be a new number out now as you're watching this, but it's not out by the time I'm recording this. So if it's down again, we're, we're even, <laughs> we've continued the deflation. By deflation, I don't mean falling consumer prices. I mean deflation in the money supply and the amount of dollars that are in the banking system. Uh, so in the Austrian sense is what I mean. $133 billion in one week. That's the amount of deposits that have been erased. Uh, so when's the last time we hit that number? In March 15th, 2023, this is seasonally adjusted. So it does take into account the vacuum that usually happens around tax days. So the seasonal adjustments here kind of try to iron that out. Uh, and we see here in March 2023, during the banking crisis, the regional bank crisis, uh, deposits only fell by 132 billion. So this week was even worse than that, even taking into account the tax day seasonal factors. The last time we had a deflationary week so extreme was back here in September 2001. We all remember what happened then. Uh, there was a big influx of money as the Fed was trying to cushion uh, the bank system after the terrorist attacks. And then there was a big deflationary episode here. So that was the only time when we saw a greater deflationary week than what we just saw this past week. And who knows what the numbers are this week. You should know what they are. I encourage you all to look them up. Just look up deposits at FRED and you'll find them. Faber highlights the concerning trend of monetary deflation as evidenced by shrinking bank reserves and deposits. He distinguishes this form of deflation from consumer price deflation and warns of the potential for stagflation, a scenario characterized by rising consumer prices alongside falling asset prices. Faber predicts that such conditions could prompt the Federal Reserve to initiate further rounds of money printing, accelerating the onset of a financial end game driven by monetary panic. So the conclusion here, my friends, is that we are headed into another deflationary wave, not consumer prices. I don't, I'm not talking about consumer prices. Those will continue to rise. You can have consumer inflationary epics together with actually financially or monetarily deflationary time periods. They can coexist. And that is where stagflation comes from, rising consumer prices, falling asset prices. If reserves are falling and deposits are falling, that is where we are headed. And once we are headed there and it's undeniable, the Fed will, of course, reflate print again. And that should take us to the end game within months, uh, who knows how many months, but it shouldn't be that long because the next printing round is going to be quite extreme, triggered by whatever crisis comes next. And just as we're seeing gold starting to break out relative to commodities, once we do have that final printing round, we will have gold and silver climbing relative to other commodities, not because of any lockdowns, but because of monetary panic.